Hello, everyone. I'm Victor Glass, your host for today's webinar, The Texas Power Freeze First Impressions. This webinar is produced by Rutgers Center for Research in Regulated Industries. For those of you who are not familiar with CRI, its mission is to promote research, scholarship, and education in regulatory economics aimed at improving public policy. The center has been in existence for more than 40 years. It was founded by Dr. Michael Crew, a distinguished professor at Rutgers University. I'm the current director and the host today. The main focus of CRI is on utility regulation. That includes electric utilities, water, gas, postal, and telecom. Please visit our website for more information. The theme of uh, today's webinar is, uh, and the focus is, is on first impressions of well-known energy analysts for improving public policy after the Texas power freeze disaster. The panelists will tackle three basic questions. What went wrong? What could have prevented the fiasco? What should we do to fix it? So let me uh, mention the names of the moderator and panelists, and then I'll go through short bios for each one. The moderator, again, in this uh, webinar, as in several past ones, is Gene Fox. The panelists are Paul Santolella, Eric Jimon, Jim Lazar, Amy, Amory Lovins, and Allison Silverstein. So let me give you a short uh, uh, bio for each. Uh, Gene Fox is an adjunct professor at Columbia University and at Rutgers University. She served as commissioner of the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities from January 2002 until September 2014. And she was a president of the board. And she was also on the governor's council uh, between uh, January 2002 and 2010. Notably, Jean is a member of Rutgers Hall of Distinguished Alumni, which says a lot. Paul Santolella is president of his own company, and he's a senior consultant at Tabor's uh, Karamanis uh, and Ruk Davish. Rude Kavich, that's a tongue twister, which I didn't succeed at. And uh, he's a former commissioner in, uh, uh, in, uh, from Ohio, and he currently serves on the US Secretary of Energy's Electricity Advisory Committee, where he chairs the Smart Grid Committee, subcommittee. Eric Jumon. He's a consultant and technical expert and a policy advisor with energy innovation. He's, uh, he works on a power sector transformation team and uh, they collaborate on policy solutions for clean, reliable and affordable electric power in the United States. Our next uh, profile is of Jim Lazar and just want to point out that he helped arrange this webinar. He was instrumental. He's uh, based in Olympia, Washington. He's worked on education, training, technical studies, and electric, electricity around the world. He's the author of Electricity Regulation in the United States, plus important handbooks on electric cost allocation, rate design, and utility resource planning. Jim retired from regulatory assistance project in 2020 and works for a very limited number of clients in global energy policy. Amory Lovins is co-founder and chairman emeritus of the Rocky Mountain Institute. He's an adjunct professor of civil and environmental engineering and scholar 
at the Precourt Institute of Energy at Stanford University. He's been an energy advisor to major governments and firms, including more than 100 utilities in 70 plus countries uh, for 45 plus years, author of 31 books and 700 plus papers. Lots of pluses in there. Uh, Time has named uh, Amory as one of the world's 100 most influential people and foreign policy has, has named him one of the 100 top global thinkers. Amory, uh, Allison Silverstein is a consultant, uh, independent consultant with a consulting company named Allison Silverstein Consulting. She's organized and wrote the US Department of Energy's staff report on electric uh, markets and reliability in 2017 and co-authored a customer focused framework for electric system resilience in 2018. She worked as a senior advisor and chairman to Pat Woods uh, at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission from 2001 through 2004 and co-chaired the 2003 US Canada blackout investigation. She has worked for the Public Utility Commission of Texas and for Pacific Gas and Electric Company. Uh, she uh, currently serves on the boards of the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy and the Health Alliance for Austin Musicians. She lives in Austin, Texas. The format of the program, the webinar, is that it will be panel discussions moderated by Jean and followed by open discussions. Please turn off your microphone and video camera and please direct okay, your I'm comments. My computer now. And please direct your, please direct your comments to Jean through the Q&A window. But you can also use the chat option for offline discussion. Okay, with that, I will stop sharing and I will turn it over to Jean. Well, this is the easy part for me because we're gonna have each of these experts and I'll tell you these guys know this thing, but you probably know that if you're on board. Uh, and we're starting with the Texan on, on our panel of experts, Allison. Allison, uh, I got to know her in 2003 when she really headed up the joint uh, Canadian US great blackout of 2003 where I was a New Jersey person on that. Uh, Allison lived through what's happening in Texas, uh, and she's going to start with an overview of that. Allison, take it away. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so let's see if we can pull up my slides. Can you see them? Got it, Allison. Okay. Um, Go to slideshow and... Go to slideshow. Easy for you to say, view, slideshow. And we're off. Okay, thank you. Um, it takes a village, y'all. So I am going to talk about, I'm trying to lay a fast background for the for context. I assume that most of you have already seen many of these documents and information, so I'm not going to spend long on them. And my goal is merely to make sure that everyone has a common fact basis for the discussion that follows. This blackout started with an ice storm that covered much of Texas on um, February 11th and 12th. It was an unprecedented winter storm covering the entire state and much of the southern Midwest that, that then came in on the 14th, stayed very cold across Texas through Friday morning the 19th. As I'm sure you're aware, 48% of ERCOT's nameplate capacity was lost or was unavailable. ERCOT and the transmission and distribution utilities within ERCOT shed over 20,000 megawatts of load. These affected four and a half million customers starting at about 1.30 a.m. Monday morning and most of them staying out of service through Thursday or Friday. There was, um, as I hope you are aware, little or no rotation of outages because the magnitude of load shed was so great. There was no one else left off a critical facility circuit who could be dumped. So there was no one to rotate outages to. 
its frequency stayed low for so long that ERCOT says we were four and a half minutes away from a cascading grid collapse, which would have taken months until full system restoration. There were extended power outages and icy roads that complicated all of this for the people who were affected. Um, statewide, this included con some of the consequences included widespread hunger, a lot of houses in the 30 degree Fahrenheit, 40, 80 plus deaths associated with not just power loss, but also fires, um, car accidents and the like, a lot of pipe and water system freezes, unsafe water or no water service for over 20 million Texans, and extensive home and building destruction from frozen pipes. Um, whoever somebody Bartholomew is, this, this particular graphic is something he put together from a lot of material that ERCOT and others made available, and he turned it into a super useful PowerPoint document. Um, some of the things I want to point out to you are that this shows at the top the load, actual load, and the gray on, above that is the load forecast. Thermal plant outages are in red. Actual wind and solar production is in blue at the bottom. And this starts on February 11 and runs through February 19. Um, the previous ERCOT winter load was blown through. That was about 69,000 megawatts, the load forecast here. We think that if actual load had been able to continue going to deal with this cold, Amory's going to talk, I believe, about why that load was so high in this cold weather. We could have had um, actual load up in the 77, 76 gigawatt without blackouts and conservation. And this red line, thermal plant outages, again, this was um, started rising on the 14th due to icing at a variety of plants and ended up, as I said, with 48.6% of the total ERCOT generation out of service. This is the view from the ERCOT control room. Whoop. OK, I've lost where I am. This is it. OK, this is the view from the ERCOT control room at 1.23 AM on the morning of February 15. The blue line is frequency, and the point of this is to help you understand what was going on in real time as the ERCOT dispatch team and management was looking at what was going on on the grid. The thing that is startling here to see is that by 1.23 a.m., ERCOT had already lost 35 gigawatts of generation capacity. And this is the first time they ordered load shed as opposed to automatic load shed. And then you see frequency wiggling up because load dropped a little bit. I'm surprised, frankly, it was already in that good condition. Um, frequency, of course, reflects the balancing of demand and supply. And you see as we progress from 123 across the time going out to um, 2.03 a.m. that morning, you see frequency starting to drop as more and more generators fall offline. And ERCOT responding with additional load shed. This is in red at the bottom. And um, frequency dips below 59.4, starting at about 151 or so, and stays down there for over four minutes. They would have lost more load, and they would have essentially gone into an un- limited grid collapse had this gone on for much longer. So you see when they started getting actual load cuts at this point that the frequency starts bouncing back up. I want to be very clear here that um, I fully support, speaking as a veteran of the 2003 blackout and on behalf of grid managers everywhere, I fully support the ERCOT operators and management for calling for the level and speed of the load cuts that they did. The cardinal rule of grid operations is to work with and protect the grid you've got and to avoid cascading collapse. Had there been a collapse, it would have caused a much greater disaster for Texans and for the entire US economy when you consider all the things that would have been affected by that. This is a graph of generation capacity that was out during the freeze event. I want to point out, just for those of you who haven't seen this graphic before, I pasted two different graphics from the ERCOT board presentation together. 
The top one is the peak generation capacity that was out in terms of the total, that's the, the black line. And then the lines below it reflect natural gas in green, nameplate wind capacity in blue, and then coal is the gray line and um, nuclear is the flat line at the bottom and PV is kind of bouncing around there. Natural gas production is this slide. A lot has been made of whether this was a natural gas problem. And of course, Texas being one of the producing a quarter of the United States gas supply, the role of natural gas in this is a big deal. And the failure of so many natural gas and thermal plants to perform is a big deal. Let us be very clear here that the um, natural gas production, there has been some testimony in, in Texas about whether that was natural gas production or the, you know, was this a chicken or the egg? Did the power plant load cuts cause natural gas failures of natural gas plants or not? Or was it a gas pr a problem on the gas system? And the answer is all of the above, but to be very clear, if you look at this graph of dry gas production, all of the, um, the entirety of gas production because of the cold within the United States started falling around January 9th. And so it was way down well before power plants and, and load was cut on the 14th. Price spikes for natural gas, which contributed to the height of electricity prices within Texas, started going up. The forward prices started going up in the middle of the week of the 9th and the spot prices started spiking well around the 10th, 11th, 12th as the, as the magnitude of the demand forecast for gas was showing up. So the whole gas phenomenon is pretty clearly started on the gas side before the electric load cuts, although it is very, very certain that, that other prices, other natural gas production and pipelines that were not yet harmed by the gas by the cold and by freeze-offs within the gas fields could themselves have been harmed and exacerbated the problem even further when loads were cut. This is just for the sake of thoroughness, the graphic of available generation and estimated load without load shed and with load shed. The estimated with load is the top red dotted line and the turquoise line reflects load that could not be served without additional generation. The black line at the bottom is actual load shed. I want to remind everybody that this was not just an electric phenomenon. Most of you are on the phone because you're electricity geeks or regulators or practitioners, but let us be super clear that this problem had a lot of consequences, a lot of causes and contributing factors that all played into each other and made life harder for all of us sitting in Texas. The major factors that I see and want to remind you about are the weather, the gas system, the electric system, the water system, and the people. The weather numbers here across the top is the calendar. The weather numbers here are the average temperatures in Dallas, which doesn't tend to get that cold in the winter, y'all. So um, it was pretty freaking cold across all of Texas for this entire period. The gas system started shutting down pipelines in, on the 11th and 12th when we had the first ice storm and the first bad roads hit on the 11th and the 12th. And then the snowstorm hit on the 13th. And then it's only on the 14th after a lot of roads have been iced in. And it gets really cold that we had the overnight, while well, the power plant started caving on the late on the 14th. And we had the spike in electricity demand of about um, 66,000, 69,000 gig ex megawatts, excuse me. But did it again, sorry. And then we continued to have bad weather and icy roads and very difficult transportation for the rest of that week. It isn't until Friday the 19th that most people were restored to service. So there's a line for gas production. And when the gas cuts happened, there is announcements about the ERCOT on the electric line, some of the events for ERCOT. And one of the things that was frustrating for folks trying to restore service is that as they were trying to bring more generation back on around the 16th, more generators were falling out. 
I don't know why that's one of the reasons that a forensic analysis and careful detailed sequence of events about what failed when and why is going to be so important. Water systems started failing on the 15th. The city of Abilene shut down its water due to electricity outages because they couldn't keep their pumps running. And that was the first of the water system failures that I saw, but I haven't scrutinized every single detail of this yet. House pipes started freezing up. We started hearing about that on the 16th. I'm sure it started earlier. Tuesday the 16th was the first time we didn't have hot water. Actually, it wasn't the first time. It was the first time I started complaining about it. Water systems started officially admitting the problem and calling for conservation on the 17th. And I want to point out that today there are still a lot of homes and, and towns without safe drinking water to this day, three weeks after the outage. And lest we forget the human consequences of all this, there was a 130 vehicle pileup from icy roads on February 11th, scattered power outages across parts of Texas on the 12th due to the usual trees across power lines, frozen lines, et cetera. The 15th was when we first had massive outages within ERCOT. Roads continued icy and dangerous. People started losing cell service. There was through this entire time, minimal government communication and minimal communication from the utilities about what was going on and why. Stores were closed. There were also, lest we forget, outages across Louisiana, Oklahoma, and Mexico. Stores were closed so people couldn't get more food or water. And starting by the 16th and 17th, we started hearing about deaths from carbon monoxide poisoning and hypothermia, although those were certainly happening earlier. To date, there have been at least 80 deaths reported from all of this. And, and, and there are very few Texans other than Rick Perry, who apparently seems to think this was worth the learning experience. Oh. Um, sorry, Jeannie, go on mute if you're gonna laugh. Last, um, electric prices are just one of many problems through this entire event. The 15th is when the PUC ordered ERCOT to hold the price cap at $9,000 per megawatt hour. And um, the red line here for ERCOT ends rotating outages is when apparently the PUC thinks ERCOT should have restored prices to let the market float. Um, I do not have a publicly expressible view on this, except to say that it's not clear to me that when you have that many power plants down, setting a $9,000 per megawatt hour incentive can bring a power plant back from the dead soon enough to make it to be a meaningful incentive. So with all of that, I returned the, the show to you, Jeannie. Thank you. I'm sorry for laughing, but it was funny. Uh, <laughs> Next, we have Avery, and he, I think everybody knows who he is, uh, but his, the headline of his scream is Messing with Texas. So Avery Levinsville, founder of Rocky Mountain Institute and very well known around the world, uh, also knows how to use words. Uh, Avery, start telling us about how they were messing with Texas. Okay, thank you. So these graphs show in uh, two styles last month's Texas electricity supply for the whole month. You see, early and late Feb had normal operation with wind in green and solar in yellow whenever available, displacing gas in light brown and coal in dark brown. Then the mid-month brought those four days of blackouts, perhaps the costliest disaster ever to hit Texas. Most analysts focus on the supply side, namely <clears throat> how two February storms strained and then shriveled Texas' bountiful gas supply by freezing unwinterized infrastructure, while many electric generators also froze. Uh, gas plant output ended up falling 17 gigawatts, coal four, nuclear one just missing three more, the calmed and frozen wind 13 from nameplate rating, snow covered solar one, all in gigawatts. But the resulting 34 gigawatt coincident generating shortfall, 21 of it thermal, exposed technical, institutional and governance flaws that mattered only because of a huge demand event. Intense cold boosted normal loads by an estimated 35 gigawatts of peak electric heating load. That's nearly twice the maximum 20 <clears throat> gigawatts that ERCOT shed. <clears throat> it is twice the lost gas fire generation. 
It's more than the total shortfall in supply. And it's nearly half the 77 gigawatt total peak demand that if met would have been two gigawatts over the summer record. Now, these vast heating loads came from an often inefficient building stock, half of it housing, heated mainly by electricity. In extreme weather, that fragile combination risks hypothermia or heat stroke, and it endangers all Texans' electricity and gas supplies. Two-thirds of Texas homes were built before there was a state building code. Half of them have big air leaks and little or no wall insulation, limited attic insulation, and single glazing. The blackouts could have been abated, if not averted, by asking Texans the day before to turn thermostats and water heaters down and appliances off, drain their pipes into open containers, leave those out to freeze, then put it back into unplugged refrigerators and freezers to preserve food. But customers were only asked, late, vaguely, and ineffectually, to conserve energy, so they didn't know how to help, nor that they held that much power in their hands. Despite days of advance notice from weather forecasters and gas markets, these supply-focused and summer-focused state institutions were unprepared, alas, to sustain interlocked supplies or to tell retail customers how best to mobilize a decisive behavioral rapid response. Instead, political leaders blamed each other and scapegoated renewables. So how did those perform? Let's return to Allison's third slide and look down at the bottom in aqua. Wind and solar were initially blamed 128 times by Fox News in two days, I'm told, for triggering the Texas disaster. So was the Green New Deal, not yet adopted anywhere. But the aqua line at the bottom shows how wind and solar actually met ERCOT's 2.1 gigawatt extreme winter peak average expectation in its forecast for all but 10 hours. Constrained much more by expected and actual low wind speeds than by freezing, but overperforming throughout the rest of the blackout week. Meanwhile, the red curve shows the operable thermal capacity fell from 70 to 45 gigawatts in a few hours, of course, a much bigger unpredicted failure. ERCOT initially reported 16 to 18 gigawatts of wind outage, later revised to 13, but that only meant production below full nameplate rating. February is normally a low wind month in Texas, so the ERCOT forecast included only 7.1 average gigawatts of wind power, or 1.8 in the extreme winter peak forecast, plus 0.3 gigawatts of solar. So renewables actually underperformed the blue dotted line, the contingency expectations, by at most 1.4 gigawatts for one hour, 18 hours into the outage, while over 30 gigawatts of thermal capacity was down. The Wall Street Journal's five editorials didn't get that over 20-fold difference, and their ideological fervor, alas, did not keep Texans warm. Of course, winterizing the wind turbines could have been a smart investment to earn astronomical prices in the 80-hour crisis, but it would have added only a few gigawatts when most needed because, as expected, the winds were light then. Meanwhile, under six or eight inches of snow, the shallow-pitched Austin solar panels produced about 60% less on 15, 16 September, then they rebounded. ERCOT Solar uh, produced two or three gigawatts, 15 to 18 Feb, four to five gigawatts the next week while wind returned to a robust 12 to 20 gigawatts. So look who is most resilient. Finally, how did all these systems interact? <laughs> Going back to Allison's remark, you know, a chicken is an egg's idea for making eggs. These things all interlock. The strong interconnections between complex systems made this event severe and could well have made it catastrophic. And we'll see more and worse cascading failures if we don't grasp these linkages all over the country. Most obviously, gas, electricity, and water all depend on each other. It's unclear yet if Texas regulators really understood this, especially if managing these interactions means actually regulating when markets fail. We don't yet know, for example, well, we don't know a lot of things. How much gas-fired power supply failed directly from cold and how much from lack of gas? How much gas production, processing, compression, often electric now, and deliverability were cut by lack of electricity? How much gas customers couldn't directly use without electricity was there, like furnace and boiler ignition fans and controls? So gas stuff may not have worked. How much water supply failed for lack of pumping power versus freeze-ups? How much power supply and maybe gas failed for lack of water? 
or if Comanche Peak and the other still working reactors had failed on under frequency or loss of offsite power, how would the grid have coped with one or two weeks of downtime, which Allison may recall nine northeastern states suffered in 2003 when it took them two weeks for nine plants to regain eight lost gigawatts and a few days to regain any because of neutron poisoning. Texans were also lucky not to have been immobilized by failed filling station pumps that now foolishly and needlessly depend on grid power. Absent the icy roads in the pandemic, that immobility would have paralyzed action within a few days. That is what added a week or two to recovery after recent major storms in states further north because first responders and genset owners soon couldn't pump any fuel. Every grid powered filling station in the country ought to untangle its pump wiring from the convenience store and pump with battery backed solar power. There is also a long tail still to come of potential public health consequences, maybe from drinking bad water and in the months and years to come, illness and huge often uninsured costs from immune suppressing black mold inside walls that got soaked by burst pipes. Most fundamentally, this disaster, as I began with, was caused as much by inefficient electrically heated houses as it was caused by failed gas supplies and power plants. So when will Texas seriously consider and exploit its immense energy efficiency opportunities and compare and compete them against supply side resources? Thank you. You are perfect, Gabriel. We do have a clarifying question for you. Could you clarify you're saying that demand conservation could have prevented the blackouts, question mark. In other words, uh, you looked at what load could have been likely reduced and compared with the magnitude of supply side outages. Is that the case? Yeah. Well, the 35 gigawatts of peak electric heating load is my estimate. Uh, I was able to find in a, a paper that Joshua Rhodes co-authored a great uh, summer and winter ERCOT graph from 2018, in which they found the winter, winter uh, weather sensitive load was 29.1 gigawatts. And I simply scaled that to this storm uh, for the colder temperature and a few percent population growth in residential only. Now, I then went back and estimated from some anecdotes and my knowledge of buildings, uh, how much of the peak could have been averted uh, by turning down thermostats to 60 or even into the 50s wearing warm clothes and caps. A lot of people could have done that if asked specifically to. How much you could save on water heaters. I used the EIA data to look up what water heaters and appliances and so on used, uh, unplugging fridges and freezers, backing up with outdoor made ice. And it looks to me like a, a vigorous citizen response if informed and, and engaged uh, could have uh, made up most or all of the uh, shortfall. Now those numbers get real fuzzy real fast. The dynamics of buildings are complicated the data on the Texas building stock are pretty bad. I use the NREL uh, database, but it's only as good as the field observations. But you know, no state data, no, uh, building code till 2001. So two thirds of the buildings were built before that, or houses, I should say, single family houses. That's 70% of the housing stock. Um, and uh, I think this ought to be looked into. I have, uh, I understand an op-ed coming out in a major Texas paper on this topic. Uh, and I'm sure people, the Texas experts with the simulation tools could figure out what could actually have been done. Certainly it would have made the events much less severe, whether it could have averted the grid collapse uh, needs more careful, careful calculation then I've got data and tools to do. But on estimate, it looks pretty good. Thanks, Avery. Our, our next presenter is actually uh, Eric Jamon, uh, and uh, he'll be followed by, Eric, uh, by Jim afterwards. Eric, take it away. And by the way, you're not really in that beautiful place that's in your background. No, no, I'm not. But uh, I don't think you want to stare at my curtains. I am um, I'm in my passive solar banana farm near Aspen. <laughs> I wish I had a banana farm too. 
Yeah. Um, so thank you very much uh, for having me on for this panel. It's, it's uh, been an excellent presentation so far. And it's a real privilege to be here with my co-panelists. Um, my, I've taken it as my job today to talk about some um, electricity market insights uh, from, from this crisis. So uh, I agree with everything for the most part that our, our previous panels have talked about and especially the importance of the demand side. But um, I think from a wholesale supply of electricity side, the crisis really st starts in the gas market. You see that US natural production dropped 21%, Texas natural gas production dropped 45%. Uh, natural gas demand also went up with heating needs. So, you know, when Amory talked about increased demand from on the electric side, there was also increased demand on the, on the, on the gas side, which then fed into problems on the electric side. And gas generators are heavily exposed to the gas spot market for reasons that are complicated, uh, but basically they don't uh, tend to be on firm contracts. And um, the KD, the uh, nearby spot price went up to $400 in MBTU, which is about hundred times more than 100 times normal. And some, some generators couldn't get delivery. So for a marginal gas generator and electricity markets are oriented to set prices based on the marginal unit, uh, just fuel was $4,000 a megawatt hour. So how did that translate in the energy markets? So we saw that there were some earlier storms with some spikes. Uh, this is the dark blue here. Now, just to understand for scale, the normal price of electricity is like these minimal amounts that you see here on, on the left. That's where, that's where it normally is. That's, that's where the average is. These, these are really extreme. But th these, these dark blue spikes are kind of what you expect when you're getting near system stress. Like in the summertime, we'll see you know, spikes like this. And um, they don't have a huge impact on customer bills for the most part. And they act as a very important signal to stimulate um, investment in, in the resources that will ride through kind of uh, periods of stress. This light blue period is a disaster, okay? So from the, from the market point of view, there were two failures. One, we didn't get the supply we needed or we got too much of the demand as Amy pointed out. But second, we got this huge bill, okay? This is $44 billion on the energy market Add to that another eight and a half billion from the ancillary services market. And this is a $50 billion bill. Now, what does that mean? Okay. The average price of electricity fluctuates between $25 and $35 a megawatt hour. Some years lower, some years higher. Okay. If you just take the amount of money I'm talking about and say, what will that do to the average price this year of 2021? It's gonna bump up the price by $135. This is a massive impact. Now, the typical impact of a big time summer scarcity event, like the one we saw a year, year and a half in 2019, is something like six to $10 uh, impact to the annual average, okay? so. The, those, those bonanza summers for, for marginal gas generators are, are summers where the, the overall bill for the year might go up six or $10. Now, the question is, did this incentivize supply? I talked about how those little spikes, you know, not that little, but little by comparison, uh, tend to do a good job of incentivizing new entry into the ERCOT market. Should, what, what should we think of this massive light blue block? Well. Imagine a frozen wind farm, it missed about $100, $180 a kilowatt in, 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 opportun in, in foregone revenue, right? If they'd been able to operate at the wind speeds they had and so on, about 20% capacity factor, they would have made $180 per kilowatt. When they installed those plants, if they'd paid an extra $15 a kilowatt, they would have been winterized and they would have been able to, to, to get the full value for their plant. Now that, that is a big gap. You know, to me, that speaks to an incentive system that's not working. Similarly, uh, for a frozen gas plant, it's a little hard to know how much it would have cost to better winterize. Some of them theoretically had been winterized. We do know from PJM what the cost of protecting against the uh, fluctuations in the gas supply by putting in dual fuel costs. It costs about $10 per kilowatt year for a CCGT and about half that for a combustion turbine. So. That's 
you know, if you divide out the 900 by, you know, that's a uh, hundred years worth of, of doing this, you know, you can do discounting or whatever, but pretty clear that something like this that happens every 30 years uh, would still pay for you. So from a market design point of view, you have to ask, why didn't they advance, right? And the clear answer is, well, they didn't anticipate that this kind of big bonanza. Now, it's important to explain that this is a gross bill, right? There, isn't, there wasn't 54 billion that went directly from customers into generators' hands because typically the risk is shared between generators and, and, and customers through hedging arrangements. I, as, as, as a retail load, I may, I may arrange a physical hedge, so I may own a generator, uh, you know, that's the kind of Gentailer model, or I might have a long-term supply agreement at a fixed price uh, using fixed, you know, contracts for differences. I might also have financial hedges. So the long-term supply agreement might just be a swap. And very importantly, I will typically have, if I'm, if I'm a, a prudent uh, retailer, I will have call options. So I have the option of getting power at a certain price if it gets, if, if the price spikes up, okay? And then uh, if I'm a really uh, clever retailer, I'm gonna invest in derivatives in the gas markets so that I, there's a place where I make money if I lose money in the electricity sector. The problem with hedging is, look, the hedging strategies are, are gonna orient around these 10 year old, $10 annual bumps in prices, okay? Not this $135 thing. And as Amy explained, most of this surge in demand came out of the residential sector. So if you're serving residential load, you, know, you might have hedged to 120% of expected load, but you saw 250%. So uh, almost nobody's going to be hedged at that level, okay? And those who had physical hedges, like say uh, CPS in San Antonio, they had to shell out a whole bunch of money to pay for gas for their gas plants. The risk management mindset is conditioned around summer events, not a winter crisis. And of course, there's huge counterparty risks. Um, the result, well, some small retailers went bankrupt. They couldn't recoup. Uh, from their customers that they're offering money uh, service to at a fixed rate. Other players have to do big write-offs on their balance sheet. But I mentioned CPS, 800 million in extra gas charges, 200 million in electricity. Generation fleet owners have to cover obligations. S smart winners are keeping quiet. No, nobody, they, no, they, nobody wants everyone to know how much money they made uh, in this crisis. I think of this as, is not just the pipes bursting in the homes, if you think of the whole system, the energy system, that pipe burst too. It's just so much pressure going through there, right? This the incredible financial flow that everywhere there's a weakness or something not well thought out had created the possibility of a big financial exposure. So I'm going to finish with lessons, try to get in my, under my eight minutes. You know, these are not new. This big freeze was a fat tail event, or what Paul will call a high impact common mode event. And to deal with fat tail events, you need a holistic approach to manage and mitigate. This is not a capacity market versus energy market issue, much to uh, disdain some people. And it's cheaper to invest on the demand side than the supply side. And finally, policymakers have to think about managed failure, okay? Things fail. You can't have 100% reliability and you're not always gonna design things perfectly. And when things fail, you need to fail well, okay? In your car, you have seat belts and crumple zones so you don't die in a crash. Here, we could have had better circuit breakers for the markets. We could have funneled investment into measures that make the system more resilient. There could have been better crisis, uh, responsive demand in a crisis through price signal, emergency rates, communication, and more granular outages. Thank you. Thank you, that was wonderful, Eric. Uh, now, Jim Lazar, who I think most people know, he's been very helpful to Victor and, and Rutgers on setting all this up. He knows everybody, uh, but it's the Washington State, which is a good place to be. Jim, take it away. Thanks a lot. Uh, the Texas crisis was really a reminder of lessons every region seems to learn every decade or so. It's not the first time it's been really cold in Texas or elsewhere. And then we tend to promptly forget those lessons. Under extreme conditions, stuff breaks. That happened in the California power crisis in 2000, 2001. It happened in the Northeast in the 
summer of 2003. It happened in the 2014 polar vortex in the Midwest and Northeast. It happened in Texas in 2011, and it will happen again. Markets can only deal with extreme conditions up to a point. Once the last available generating resource has been dispatched, there's really nothing more a wholesale supply side market can do in real time. A demand side market can do more, but most customers did not directly encounter the wholesale price. There can be critical peak pricing, there can be peak time rebates, there can be aggregators, operating demand response programs uh, or other mechanisms. They weren't in place in Texas and California had exactly the same problem in its 2000 power crisis. Capacity by itself is a meaningless term. So-called firm resources like coal, gas and nuclear fail often we, when we need them most as some did in Texas last month and non-firm resources like wind and solar often do perform in extreme conditions, as many did in Texas. A capacity market is no solution to any of Texas's problems. We really can't solve problems like this exclusively on the supply side, and we should not try. We don't build 20 lane freeways so that just in case multiple accidents block 12 lanes, everybody can still get to work on time. We can and should make provision to address this type of crisis on the demand side. The benefits are wide ranging and the costs are affordable. I'll give some examples here. Smart thermostats front and center. If ERCOT had been able to reduce heat temperatures to 50 or 55 degrees, Texas would have reduced gas and electric load by 25% or more. Control of water heaters, laundry equipment, spas, pools, and other large, less critical loads would have allowed limited supplies to serve lights, computers, communications, and other more essential loads. We can Implement this type of control system with existing available technology. We can directly control loads, what I call smart curtailment, rather than the blunt curtailment that Texas experienced. But Allison tells me that people in Texas will no sooner give up control of their thermostats than they will give up their guns. Well, we just saw the result of that kind of short-sighted thinking. But there is perhaps a, another solution, and that's rationing electricity under system stress. Smart meters now allow selective remote shutoff. Every customer could be rationed to 10 kilowatt hours per day during a period of stress. Those who are careful to get 24 hour service to essential loads. Others will consume until their allocated share runs out and then the lights go out for another two or five or 17 hours. This approach, a variation on this approach actually worked very well for the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power during the first oil embargo in 1973. Over 90% of their electric consumers controlled their usage within their reduced allocation during that crisis. We have options. We have solutions. We must be ready to use them. Thanks. Thank you. You, you win the prize for brevity, Jim. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, last but certainly not least is Boris Angelella, who I knew as a commissioner. We worked closely together on the NARIC Energy Resources and Environment Committee, but he's a real great academic type of guy. He wrote a recent EPRI report, which you probably have seen. Uh, he'll be talking about that, but right now he'll be talking about learning from te about Texas and what exactly happened with planning. Take it away, Paul. Uh, electric and, ga and natural gas systems in Texas failed with tragic consequences. But in one sense, this is a familiar story, a reliance on a way things have been done in the past that collided with a new reality. 
What changed is the increasing frequency and intensity of severe weather. The coincident failures in power and natural gas systems, an unexpected surge in demand was a high impact common mode event, a correlated failure of seemingly independent systems with a common cause, severe weather. I'll make some observations about extreme weather events and the gaps they expose in current practices. I'll introduce a roadmap for improving supply planning, which is more fully described in a report that I and my colleagues at Tabor's Karamanis Rutkovich did for EPRI and discuss an RPE project to create a more resilient power market. Next slide, please. Extreme weather is no longer a, a low frequency event. The average number of US weather events uh, causing a, uh, over a billion dollars in damages has increased fivefold from 2.9 per year in the 1980s to 15 such events per year over the last four decades. The average annual cost of these billion dollar events has increased from 17.8 billion in the 1980s to $157 billion per year from 2017 to 2019 or 8.6 times the average in the 1980s. Next slide. Mounting annual damage costs have coincided with more frequent extreme weather events and a much faster increase in their intensity and geographic scope. Recall the five named tropical storms simultaneously crossing the Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico while the West was being devastated by wildfires last September. Climate models indicate that the trends shown on this slide will continue and accelerate. Next slide. Current resource adequacy metrics, such as effective load carrying capacity, loss of load expectation and reserve margin do not adequately recognize the probability of correlated impacts on the output of multiple resources or account for the depth, breadth and duration of significant outages. One, these metrics and most supply plants assume that generator outages are independent and uncorrelated. This assumption of independence is no longer valid. Two, they're based on engineering heuristics that are not consistently supported by economic studies. And three, such pass fail metrics fail to distinguish between limited and widespread long duration outages. Additionally, power system planning often understates the risk of common mode events. Consider four components in ERCOT's 2020 seasonal assessment of resource adequacy for the winter. One, the range of potential risks included only three sensitivity cases. Two, the planners failed to consider the possibility that extreme peak demand and extreme muted outages might coincide with low wind output. Three, the sensitivities were each based on brief ranges of historical data for the par that parameter, which understated the conditions actually observed. And four, ERCOT does not appear to have considered how severe weather could impact gas supplies. A reasonable approach would have been to use weather trends and probabilistic forecasts to identify likely worst case scenarios. Next slide. This slide presents a daily series of probabilistic weather forecasts for Austin, starting with a forecast issued at 3 p.m. Central Time on February 9th. The February 9th forecast pointed to a cold snap that with the potential for temperatures to dip as low as minus 10 Celsius or 14 degrees Fahrenheit on February 14th and into single digits on the 15th and 16th. That's cold for Austin. And my understanding from talking to friends in Texas, there were other areas more heavily impacted. Subsequent daily forecasts appear in increasingly shaded plots and the blue line tracks actual temperatures. Investigators should ask, who was aware of such probabilistic forecasts and what, if any, steps did they take in response? Next slide. Texas and the nation uh, are re relying on natural gas fuels for approximately 40% of power generation. There were significant gas unit outages and D-rates in Texas on February 15th. I use some figures here from EIA and what ERCOT told the legislature in terms of outages on 15th. Postmortems should tell us more about what happened and contributed to these failures. However, investigations in both Texas and nationally should consider two key structural differences in gas operations and markets. 
First, in contrast to electricity reliability organizations, there's no mandatory gas reliability organization to collect data, report lessons learned, and set standards. To the best of our knowledge, the data needed to model the impact of gas operations on correlated outages of gas fire generators is not being collected. The Department of Transportation's incident reports have the most comprehensive source of public data on pipeline outages, capacity constraints, curtailments, and other pipeline operations. However, this data explains less than 20% of the generation loss to gas supply shortages between 2012 and 2017. Additionally, gas markets are not tightly integrated with gas and electric operations. To address this, my TCR colleagues developed a gas electric co-optimization model, GECO, that integrates Los Alamos's work on advanced transient pipeline optimization. And it identified opportunities to increase throughput in simulations of tight gas markets. Data integration and uh, data and market integration are prerequisites to understanding the reliability of gas supplies. Next slide, please. Extreme, uh, next slide. Ex uh, extreme weather events are part of our future. So what can we do? Plan for them by applying a resilience-based framework developed for critical infrastructure. Resilience planning considers how to absorb, manage, recover, and learn from disruptive events. It starts by identifying and planning for relevant high impact scenarios. Earlier this year, we prepared a report for EPRI that provides a detailed roadmap for addressing the issues of identified and improving planning for extreme events. It can be downloaded from the EPRI website. Next slide. Next. ERCOT provides significant incentives for resources to operate during scarcity. The crisis, however, raises the question but does a market that rewards mitigating investments only during scarcity provide a sufficient probability of return? TCR has been addressing this and other issues that became apparent in the Texas crisis in our current ARPA-E project. We're developing a computing platform combining granular probabilistic forecasts and power system models to reflect the risk of supply disruptions in the calculation of a marginal reliability component to be included in nodal and hourly locational marginal prices. This approach offers significant benefits, including first resources that may have the capability to operate in severe weather could be compensated across many more hours, not just when the system actually faces scarcity. Stable returns would help support investment in weather independent technologies. Second, Retailers and consumers could submit hourly demand curves, facilitating the development of smart, flexible demand. The ability of flexible demand to shape, shift, and modulate the timing of energy use in response to anticipated spot prices will be essential to realizing a resilient, low-carbon future. Neither conventional demand response nor time of use prices can achieve comparable results. If the industries and regulator improve planning and markets, we can learn how to avoid the worst impacts of extreme weather and enhance power system performance. And I think that's the task that's before us. Thanks. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, we, now, we're gonna do uh, maybe a half an hour of discussion and questions. So I wanna get into some issues, hey, Jeannie? some questions Jeannie? Uh, that have been, in the, there's a lot of questions in there, but so we got Jeannie. kind of a what happened. Some questions are though, how did, and I thought it was in one of the slides, but nuclear power. We talked about wind, nuclear, the gas uh, generators. Uh, somebody want to give us the, what happened with the nuclear facilities in, uh, in Texas? Moment. Yeah, 1.3 gigawatts uh, failed on a frozen uh, control object. <laughs> uh, and that was down for a few days. They were uh, a few minutes away from losing two big units at Comanche Peak on under frequency. The issue, Allison, you'll recall from Aud 3 is that if there's a grid problem that causes a reactor to scram, as 9 did in the Northeast then, uh, 
some fission products that are very avid absorbers of neutrons uh, then can keep the reactor from restarting. It, it took them a few days in the Northeast when those reactors went from 100% output to zero to get any output and two weeks to get back full output. So they were lucky not to have that problem. Thank you. Allison, uh, back to, to our Texan and residents. Uh, you want to do some, some issue here. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to talk about, since, since Amory was answering the question about restart, I'm going to cover that and then I'll go to some policy observations and thoughts. On the restart issue, it is true that we were able to bring the grid back after 2003 relatively cleanly. That is because none of the, it was a fairly well-managed shutdown and because we had things like Niagara Falls to help start the Black Star process. Yes. There's no Niagara Falls in Texas, y'all. <laughs> and the, after the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake, we helped to start the PG&E grid in Northern California using an a, a aircraft nuclear submarine. I mean, a, 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 a aircraft carrier parked at Alameda Air Station. We don't have a lot of those in Texas either. Black start is incredibly complicated. And the fact that if there is a cascade that can in fact trip off plants in a way that a lot of equipment can be broken severely. And you cannot put the grid back together until you check every single one of those plants top to bottom, every element of it to make sure that it's working. And remember that this was during an ice storm when you can't get crews into your plants and if anything is broken, you don't, can't get spare parts in. So the process of putting everything back together legitimately could have taken many days or many weeks in order you can, to, you can, to get everything put back together. Someone saying there are batteries, pretty sure you can't get little teeny batteries to black start all of ERCOT. So, so it is a legitimate concern that you don't want to have a collapse. And no matter how much everybody drills black start, it is still much harder than it looks. Um, and, and so if they say it could take weeks or months, I'd rather believe them than take the chance that they're wrong and take that dare. I wanna talk about a couple other issues with respect to this blackout in terms of perspective. I know that, that um, Texas has an attitude and, and I know that the rest of the nation is enjoying some schadenfreude about the fact that we screwed the pooch here. But let's remember that many of the things that went wrong here, y'all haven't fixed outside Texas either. Let's remember that NERC has just now started sending the standards for weatherization out to vote. FERC also was asleep at the switch on this. And if you read the deep in terms of not demanding that NERC produce them earlier, and if you read the NERC standards, they do not, they are written in a way that says you have to be ready to deal with the last five years worth of bad events, which would not have covered the specific event that ERCOT went through. I am not saying that ERCOT should have not done infinitely better weatherization and preparation that we did. And there is no excuse for everybody saying we were gonna do that and not filling in on it. But the fact is the rest of the nation hasn't completely fixed this in terms of mandatory winterization yet. So don't y'all go crowing on that issue. It's still voluntary almost everywhere. And, and my hat's off to all the, all the gas operators and power plant operators who actually have done competent winterization, but don't go thinking that they did it purely because someone ordered them to. Second, let's be clear that ERCOT totally screwed up as did most of the utilities in terms of the magnitude of the weather events and disaster scenarios they planned for. Paul and Amory have both talked about that very competently. But let us be clear that no one else in terms of utilities except possibly starting after Superstorm Sandy that y'all went through, most of the rest of the nation has done a terrible job and even after Sandy, y'all have not broadly done a competent job in terms of conceiving of the magnitude of the disasters and the ferocity of extreme weather events. We have been treating, the industry calls every single extreme weather event that it thinks about as a high impact, low frequency event, as though every one of them is special. The fact is extreme weather events, broadly we need to consider all of them as high impact, medium frequency, and start taking them a lot more seriously with a lot more imagination. Um, 
And we also have a lot of work to do broadly about credit standards, fuel price spike protections. A lot of those things are questionable across the rest of the nation too. We just managed to screw it up bigger and badder and more publicly than everyone else has yet. Two more things. Um, a lot of the, there's a lot of talk about how to fix the Texas market, but let's be clear that a lot of the issues that we need to fix here are not about the market, but I describe them as market adjacent. Market issues are stuff like energy versus capacity market and how you define and price ancillary services and how, where you set credit worthiness screens or price caps. But things like reliability requirements and winterization, planning requirements, um, transmission construction and cost allocation, communications and early warning requirements and natural gas system preparation and very importantly, energy efficiency building codes and demand response. None of those are part of market design per se, but all of those are critical to the effectiveness of a market and to ha what happens inside the market once this kind of stuff starts happening. The last thing I wanna talk about real fast is the Texas ethos. And this is somewhat mythological, but it's legit. And it's how, our, how a lot of the people in this state and more importantly, a lot of the people in this government think. Texas is about small government, light regulation, low taxes, self-reliance and independence. A lot of people in Texas deny or discount future risks and they think cheap today is better than future profits. So they are penny wise and pound foolish. This means that we consistently as a state under protect and under insure against disasters of every imaginable kind. However, we have more and more, we're the second biggest state in the nation. We've grown over almost 15% in the last decade alone in terms of population. And there's a growing expectation among the public that the government should provide services and protect us from foreseeable harms. And there is an expectation that we should be as a state investing more in our people and our future, including physical, institutional and human infrastructure. Protection and preparation have costs and they require trade-offs and very few politicians and policymakers are good at making these trade-offs. So when you say Texas should do all of these things, remember that it's a lot easier to say it from outside than it is to get all of these things happening in the kind of political mythology and ethos I have described. And remember this conversation when you go, when this happens in your state, and your state rec governments and regulators didn't protect you from all the things that they should have thought they should have protected you from. Thanks. Thank you, Austin. Thanks. Now, a question about this. So, so, so there's a 2011 and 2014 uh, big freezes in Texas. Recommendation report by NERC said they should winterize. Uh, some of the wind turbines winterized, and I, I think Anne Marie, but I can't remember who, pointed out that if they would have spent a little bit of money, they would have been able to make a lot of money. Uh, but they didn't weatherize. In addition, I've read that El Paso actually followed those, rec followed those recommendations and winterized, and they continue to function. So anybody want to discuss that? Why? I mean, it was voluntary, but El Paso did it voluntarily. Others did not. So I will tell you one thing about that. El Paso is vertically integrated. Okay. So they could pass all the winterization costs through and rates. And El Paso is on the cold end of Texas. So it was far, it took far less imagination to expect that winterizing in El Paso would pay off. Okay. Also, do we, do we know the relative importance of their preparedness and their ability to interchange with adjacent grids, which the rest of Texas basically can't, uh, even though of course other states were very stressed as well. Okay, let's talk about gas, natural gas. Obviously, the run of the country, natural gas generation, electricity generation is inexpensive now because of hydraulic fracturing, et cetera. Uh, but we also started exporting for the first time since Jimmy Carter, uh, just a few years back, our fossil fuels, which we weren't allowed to do since Jimmy Carter. But now you know, Congress made a deal. Renewables, the Democrats got more renewable tax credits and Republicans got to export fossil fuels. Has that impacted at all? Number one, LNG exports, and number two, uh, the free marketplace of gas, and where we kind of got too close to the wire uh, and didn't have enough natural gas in addition to frozen pipes. So natural gas, Paul. So uh, am I unmuted? Yes. 
So I think one of the things that we have to recognize up front is this is not just an issue of whether we rather weatherize natural gas, although that may well have helped. Uh, if we don't gather data on what's going on with gas operations, if we can't actually see what part of the gas system is impacting the availability of gas to power systems, and if we don't do better than having a kind of bilateral or, or even where we have centralized exchanges, they're not closely integrated with pipeline, let alone electricity operations, we just don't know how reliable gas is gonna be in a situation of stress. So, I mean, this is part of why the Northeast has gone to oil backups, but there are limitations on how much oil you can back up on site as well. So, you know, I guess my, my comment to the gas industry is, is you should think about if you wanna have a real future as a reliable weather independent fuel, you should think about how can we create a, a reliability organization that actually collects and makes publicly available data that's gonna be relevant to the power industry and consumers, you know, and how can we better integrate? And this is gonna be partially directed at gas distribution utilities because they sometimes are the barrier. How can we better integrate our gas markets with gas operations and with the electric sector so that we're making maximum use of the resources that we have? Until we do those other things, I mean, we can do a bunch of things that may, if we have exactly the same sort of event again, uh, protect us, but they won't necessarily protect us from the next hurricane, the next pipeline or storage outage, you know, the next cybersecurity attack. We need to be able to look at reliability on gas in a much more holistic way than we've done up till now. And, you know, and this is partially an issue for regulators, but it's also an issue for the gas industry and, and, you know, and bringing itself up to the kind of level of reliability organizations and institutions we have in electricity. Thank you, Eric, and then Amory. Uh, thank you, Jean. Well, I wanna echo what Paul uh, said first, uh, that I, I think uh, a reliability focus on the gas side and more data would be very helpful. I, I, I think people working on the electricity side of things just don't, factor in how exposed the electricity sector is to the gas sector. I mean, not only were prices spiking in Texas, prices were spiking in Los Angeles because of what was happening in the gas sector. And uh, yeah, I noticed one commenter talked about how there, was a, there's a, there is a circuit protector in the market called the net peaker margin, where the price is supposed to drop to 2000. But in fact, the price is supposed to drop to 2000, the higher of 2000 or five times the gas, you know, 50 times the gas price, basically. So during this event, that would have set the circuit breaker price up to $20,000. Um, and it's great to have market design be tech neutral and, and, and it, as much as you can, but there has to be some acknowledgement that often the binding factor in, in, in the really extreme cases is the gas um, network. And, and maybe the rules need to account for that a little bit more uh, carefully on top of all the other elements that Paul talked about uh, of doing scenario planning, better data and so on and so on. Jean, you're on mute. And you're muted. I don't wanna laugh again. Eric, do you see that as a, a Texas Railroad Commission responsibility or is this more like a federal responsibility? I, I, I'm not a finger pointer type. Um, I think everybody has a, a plenty of work wherever they are in terms of taking lessons from this. Uh, so I, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of the ARCOT electricity market. Uh, and, and I think, but there are, I think lessons that they can take about what happened with this price event uh, and, and how they, they intersect with the gas market. Now, it, could they have useful further con conversations between the PUCT and, and the Railway Commission? Sure. Um, you know, once everybody gets back past the circular firing squad, hopefully there'll be more productive conversations. Um, I, I want to point out, this is Allison. There is some significant debate within Texas over whether the Texas Railroad Commission, which regulates gas, has the authority to compel winterization without additional legislative action. And oh. if they did have that authority, would they have the political will to do so? 
So that remains unresolved. Yes, Amory. Well, and uh, they didn't think they had the authority to divert gas from filling LNG tankers that couldn't sail anyway because of lousy weather. Uh, so they those fillings were cut in half. They should have probably been cut to about zero when the system was so hungry for gas. Okay, that's a good point. Any other points on natural gas for Texas? Okay, let's move on to the institutional, regulatory, and governance issues in Texas. Now remember, Texas politically is completely different than almost any place else in the country. Uh, uh, Texas, I, I know Allison, I, I, I knew uh, the former uh, governor, uh, Ann Richards of Texas. And I'll tell you, there are tough, strong women down there. Uh, but it also is a, uh, you know, kind of a, a, it's not New Jersey, put it that way. So Texas institutional regulatory governance, what are the gaps there that maybe Texas might want to continue consider refilling? Avery. Well, <clears throat> let's see where to start. There's a lot of finger pointing going on uh, and agencies saying they didn't have authority to do what they needed to do. It's also clear as several have said that having more inoperable capacity would not have helped. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I think we don't know very much yet about whether interstate connection beyond the 1% capacity to do so would have helped when other states were in such distress. There were at least nine other states lacking people out as well and 5 million people in Northern Mexico. <clears throat> I'm concerned about what we're observing here about the roots of institutional failure. The first people to go from ERCOT were the independent board members who were prejudicially criticized as out-of-staters, but they were there precisely to add the broader perspectives right. to what looks and acts like a Texas power industry club. Uh, and I think it's pretty clear the governance structure needs rethinking. Um, and uh, it, it basically, as the New Yorker put it, uh, sorry, the Atlantic, Robinson Meyer, this is what policy wonks politely call an energy governance problem. That is, uh, society's plans didn't make sense because they assumed gas could do an impossible number of things at the same time. And nobody noticed this beforehand because it was nobody's job to notice. Uh, one last observation, uh, and thank you, Myron Katz, for pointing this out. My house here <clears throat> has had one power failure in 25 years when a battery cell failed. Some of my neighbors recently had eight power failures in a morning. Why do I not have power failures? It's not just because I'm very efficient and have a bunch of solar on the roof and I'm a three to one net exporter. It's that I've wired the place to work with or without the grid. Under IEEE standard 1547, everybody can safely do that, but most utilities don't yet allow it. They should. Every house that puts in its own generator, every commercial building, every factory ought to be able to run gracefully and safely with or without the grid. So we build resilience from the bottom up. It's not just gas stations that need this. And, and I, that's a point where I've been coming from, with, uh, which is I have solar at my two places in New Jersey. When Sandy happens, because you can't fry the people fixing the system, the grid goes down, distribution goes down, you go down. But with now with the smart inverters are available, people who have the money, commercial, industrial, as well as larger residential probably, will be able to use a smart inverter. And actually for six days after Sandy, we had sun, couldn't use the solar because uh, we had to turn off the inverter. So that I think will help. <coughs> and it will actually change a lot of what's going that, on. That standard <laughs> keeps it safe for the line workers. In Sandy, yes. New Jersey had over a gigawatt of solar 90% was still on the roof and worked fine. Most of the 10% that flew away with the roof would still work when it yes, landed. Yes, they were still on the roof. Yeah. Not to work without the grid. Right. And that's part of why there was no way to nucleate restart and to keep vital services going during recovery and speed it up a week or two. So Jeannie, I'd, I'd like to add on to this. I'm a big fan of PV, but there is a difference between, but PV alone isn't enough. It's great for the people who can afford PV. And God bless you all. 
but everybody else who is trapped in this system needs energy efficiency and a lot of it. Within Texas, the outcomes of this are going to be there's a bunch of cheap fixes and there's a bunch of deep fixes. And the cheap fixes are going to be things like heads rolling new replacement board members and management and curbing extremely risky electric retail plans. But and, and they're going to do power plant weatherization and they're all going to lie down and take a rest. But the fact is what we need is a lot of deep fixes. And the first and most important is massive energy efficiency retrofits for low income and multifamily housing, hugely better energy efficient building codes, retrofit requirements, moving our energy efficiency resource portfolio standard, massively higher than where it is today for the transmission and distribution utilities to deliver. We need natural gas winterization for the entire system. We need massive amounts of backup power systems that include battery and PV, as well as a little bit of diesel generation for every single critical facility in the state. And no more of this nonsense about, I didn't know I needed to tell you I was a critical facility. If you can't, if only you and your mother think you're critical, why the hell should a TDU pay attention to you? Yeah. So, uh, and we need to massively better sectionalization of the transmission and distribution system to create much smaller portions because there were way too many customers piled onto a circuit that had a hospital onto it. So there's all this additional load that is non-critical larded onto critical facility circuits. And once you protect all the critical facilities, there's no one left to dump load on. So the same poor people who aren't rich enough to live next to a hospital end up in the dark for days on end. Right. And that is just wrong, wrong, wrong. <laughs> so if we do much better automated, remote actuated sectionalization in very small circuits, we can actually do contain the circuit around as a critical facility for much longer Critical facilities should be able to stand alone for yes. longer, and we should be able to legitimately rotate. And for those of you who are emailing each other saying, we could use smart meters to, to affect um, load cuts, I'm pretty much confident that all of the 2009 vintage smart meters that were installed across Texas are only operable one at a time, and you can't do them for mass on a one-off thing. So, oh but, but we do not have the customer data or the utility IT to be able to do massive on the fly sectionalization for mass blackouts on the scale that we needed here. Well, that makes me happy because I fought New Jersey getting smart meters until there were smart tariffs and people were getting them all over the country. And it was only for the utilities benefits. And now so I'm going to get better. hate mail from all the smart meter people. So sorry about that. That's okay. Eric. Uh, just a, and keep in mind that we don't know how often these uh, storms will happen, right? The, the, historically, it may be one in 30, one in 100, one in 70. I hear different things. Going forward, it could be one in 10. But, you know, for the next storm, the storm after that, maybe that's 10, 20 years. That's a pretty long time in the technology world. Um, so, so it may be that the smart meters are crap now or whatever. But, you know, 10 years from now or 15 years from now, smart panels might be a standard uh, element in, in new housing and, and, and sexualization within the house might be more common. So I, I wouldn't like foreclose uh, certain avenues, uh, you know, of, of dealing with sexualization on a more um, granular basis. And, and I think putting the blame on uh, index prices for customers is also probably not a, a great direction. Um, those people should have price protection in case of a crazy event like what we just saw. But I talked to, to a retailer that has one of these things that covered their, their, that covered their uh, customers. Uh, and, and they said, look, the ones that are on flat rates basically did nothing uh, during this. There were some of them were consuming 500 kilowatt hours in a single day. So we had this situation where some people are freezing and other people are, are in a complete glut. So you know, some kind of price signal in a crisis or emergency is important uh, is, is what I wanted to add as well. Okay, one more question before we get to, go ahead, Paul, and then we're gonna, I'm gonna ask one more question, but while I'm asking that question, I want you to look at all the Q's and A's, the 48 Q's and A's in there and pick out one that you would like to answer, Paul? Well, I just, I just wanted to, to add on to what Eric just said. 
I mean, if we want to have a resilient system and we want to have a system with variable renewables, it's going to be essential that we have a greater degree of flexible demand. This is, this is a huge potential resource. I go back to 2014 when Nest did its first rush hour rewards in Austin and reduced uh, air conditioner use in peak hours by 49% in those homes. I mean, this is you know, something that will be essential and we need to figure out how to get there. And you know, it's going to have to be something that allows that smart, flexible technology to see and respond to anticipated future spot market prices because that's the way they're gonna be able to shape, shift and modulate demand. You're not gonna do it through an event-based demand response program. You're not gonna do it through a time of use price where suddenly the price goes down and everybody responds because that'll just destabilize the system even more. You're going to have to have price signals that go through and you're gonna have to marry that as Eric suggested, you know, with you know, either you know, some demand management technology you know, with a you know, with price hedges of various sorts, and Eric did a nice job of summarizing some of that in his opening remarks. Or you know what we you know you know talked about uh, a little bit with respect to our RPE project is customers actually being able to bid in a demand curve, and one could imagine that even being automated so that you know when prices get up to two thousand dollars, then you know, your, your demand cap on your load begins to, to go down. And this would, you know, you could use technology that's widely available in Europe to, to, you know, to implement that kind of a situation because they are people actually do have demand subscriptions. And, you know, and if they use more than they've subscribed to, they get cut off until they're, they reduce their demand below their demand subscription. So there's a lot of ways that we can approach this. Uh, and protect customers, but it's essential that we find a way to do it. Yeah, the last question. Let's stay on, actually, hey, go ahead. Then let, go let's ahead. stay on this for a second because okay, I think Jay, I ahead. could snag a couple of the questions that were uh, in the chat with uh, uh, with, with uh, uh, in the discussion we've been having. Uh, I hope you're seeing a uh, yes, a, we can. a graphic of of a, a hundred and nine different pilots, and on the far right are critical peak pricing. Uh, and peak time rewards, uh, real uh, peak oriented pricing and the critical peak pricing with technology uh, options produce 30, 40 and 50% load reductions uh, in these pilots. That is a critical peak price with a smart thermostat, smart water heater, smart swimming pool pump, you know, some kind of, or, or direct load control over air conditioning. Uh, uh, connected to it, so that people sign up for uh, something in advance. The the um, one of the questions was how much will people respond? But the answer is a whole lot if there's serious money on the table, and and the technology and installed in advance of the crisis to allow them to respond immediately on a hands free basis. Uh, so I, I just wanted to pump that into the discussion we've been having about the need for flexible demand. Thank you, Jim. That's good. Has anybody seen Bob G, former Texas regulator, eons ago, his comment in there? Does somebody want to respond to that? Bob G basically says Texas is a, a wild uh, west uh, type of place, which it is. Paul? So I'll, I'll try a response and it, it, may not, it may be an incomplete response since I don't live in Texas and, and my roots are in the Midwest and now in the Northeast. <laughs> um, but you know, I think there's a good deal that can happen by structuring markets right and giving, you know, giving appropriate market signals. I don't think it has to come through, through regulatory mandates. And so, uh, you know, I don't know whether Texas has the wherewithal to be able to create a gas market that actually reflects the operational conditions of the, of the, the pipeline system and the demands of critical users, both on the gas system and you know, electric generators and, you know, uh, and other critical users on the, the electric system. But, you know, but that doesn't necessarily require a huge administrative overhead. What it requires is really a, a market structure in which gas operations and electric operations integrate. Um, and and I, I'm, I'd be interested in how, how Bob responds, but I would think that that might actually be easier if it could be done 
by integrating a local single state gas market and a single state RTO. Um, you know, but we'll see what the, the, the Texans think. Okay, now the one question I want to ask, then we'll get to questions from, from outside sources for at least 10 minutes. Uh, so you pick out a question you want to answer. This has come up and, and uh, uh, in deference to our friend up in uh, the Harvard Electricity uh, Policy Group, uh, a, a initial uh, resident from New Jersey, uh, he's really ticked off as he would want to be that the Texas marketplace is to blame for this because other people have said in different ways, Texas had a capacity market, yada, 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 not just the energy market, et cetera. And obviously Bill's response was not really happy. Anybody want to talk briefly about, because I think we all agree that a capacity market would not have helped in a Texas situation. Eric? I, I have two quick comments here. One, as I, I showed in my, slide, in my slides, there was plenty of money to be made and people did not invest for it, right? So if people aren't anticipating uh, profits, then they're not investing for profits. But it's unclear to me that anybody else would have been anticipating, including a capacity market administrator. So the first question is, would a capacity market have bought you any more uh, supply or even supply that could get fuel? And, and, and I'm pretty skeptical that that would be the case. The second thing you could say is, well, look, capacity markets typically come with a lower price cap. So at least, uh, you know, maybe I didn't get my power, but at least I'm not being kicked, you know, kicked <laughs> in the butt afterwards with this huge price bill. But the problem there is with a low price cap, we could have seen even more of this gas capacity going offline when they were facing, you know, marginal costs of $4,000 a megawatt hour. Um, and that's part of why the, the, uh, escape valve in the market is designed around the price of gas. My feeling is if you really wanted to fix this, you need to just bite the bullet, admit that you're hooked you know, at the hip with the gas system when things go bad and move to some kind of cost of service regime for, for when, when a long period of EE3 happens. So how would I do something like that? I would, I would go down to a much lower price gap, maybe three, 500, but most 1,000. So there's still incentive on the demand side to reduce and, and so on. But what, once a, a key threshold of profit has been passed, you know, go to that lower level. And then for those plants that can't run at that price, they, they can go on a cost of service type of thing where they have to justify their billing afterwards. And then you bill, you take that money and you build it as uplift the way you did a lot of the, the ancillary services and so on. It's clunky, but fortunately, you know, Hopefully you're not having to do this more than once every 10 or 20 years. This is what I call managed failure. Like you can't get so attached to, you know, Bill can't get so attached to his model about scarcity pricing that you don't recognize that sometimes it just ain't working. Um, okay. So Avery. Um, <laughs> having more inoperable capacity doesn't help. Uh, you could have an arrangement. I think there's something like this in PJM that if you're not actually available and producing in a system emergency, you don't get paid for doing so. Correct. Uh, but uh, to, to solve this problem, they had, you know, they had plenty of capacity, but over two fifths of it that they thought was reliable actually didn't work. So you have to winterize and you have to have gas uh, without, uh, for the gas plant. So without that, it doesn't help. However, I would like to know a lot more about how fully any demand response resources were called upon. There's some question about that because some utilities do have them. And I wonder statewide why we don't compete demand side resources in the same auctions as supply side and have both efficiency and demand response. Remember efficiency has a very high on peak component and value. Uh, why, why don't we put all that in the, in the same reward system that supply sees and have all resource auctions and pricing. I think in that case, these supply problems would become very much less important. Thank you. So this is Allison, and I wanna offer a couple observations. One of them is demand response only works if you have targeted at the, the challenge that you are facing. In Texas, all of our demand response is oriented toward summer air conditioning peak and not winter. And there's not a lot more load that you can cut at 1 a.m. on a February morning. 
So lighting is discretionary, stores are already closed, most factories aren't running. The amount that you have left to, to turn down is not great. Sure, now, I'm not saying it can't be done, but I'm telling you that the organized programs that we have today for demand response in Texas wouldn't have been a whole lot of help. Why not refrigerators, freezers, water heaters? Because people weren't prepared for that and we didn't have, I mean, you are talking about something in the future that people have to plan for. Oh. So let us be clear about the difference between tools that are available when operators needed them three weeks ago and things that you could dream up for the future. Yeah, very More importantly, but... I want to say for the 20th time that I would much rather protect customers than I would the system. We keep talking as though the boundaries of the electric system are what matter. Speaking as a Texas customer, and on behalf of the other 4 million people who sat in the dark and the 20 million who didn't have water, this shit is gonna keep hitting the fan yeah. from pick your disaster, whether it is bad guys hitting the grid or bad storms hitting the grid, the grid is gonna keep failing and demand response or winterized stuff isn't going to protect us from all of that. I would rather help make customers more resilient with energy efficiency and backup generation and PV and batteries and all of those things than I would just spending the money to put it in gas producer's pocket or power plant weatherization. Mm -hmm. The certain thing is that customers are going to keep getting hit from a variety of things, and I want to start by making them more resilient not just making the power system more resilient. Right. So now, let us keep the focus on the victims of this and not just on the system. And, and after Sandy, people in New York and New Jersey area got that. And so they are becoming little community solar or microgrids. Uh, certainly, uh, have a, my goal is to have every town to have certain little areas, emergency responders, EMT, some kind of facility where people could go and keep warm because the weather tree weather is going to get worse. Uh, and we still need the grid system for the, for the backup. A lot has to do with how do we still function with the distribution companies, the electric companies, being able to survive and keep going with what they need to do as the backup. But I'll tell you, I'm getting storage within the next couple of years. So I, what after the next Sandy, and there will be another Sandy, I could have electricity when it's sunny the next day. Eric? Yes, just to address uh, some of the, the questions that, that came in on the Q&A. Yes. I just wanted to pick one up on storage because that's Good. an area that I study a lot in, in the context of markets and, and what you and Allison were talking about. You know, going back to what I was saying here, right, imagine, think about the time steps here being 10 years. 10 years from now, I could very well see 60 gigawatts of storage in Texas, maybe half of it on the distributed side, half of it on the utility side, some of it like pure storage, some of it hybrids. And, and, and I think that's probably an underestimate. And so, you know, when people are thinking about how to, how to rejig things, be it from simpler sides on the market rules to, to the whole system, like Allison, you really have to take some of that in, in mind. You can't be, you know, planning to retrain your cavalry when machine guns are coming along. So that's, that's one big important thing for people to keep in mind. And the market behaviors in the presence of a lot of storage are very, very different. And, and the, the, um, probably the vulnerabilities will be quite different. And I don't think regulators are even close to ready for this. You know, when I talk to FERC people and so on, they're just not thinking about price manipulation from storage or any of these kinds of things that could happen in the context of this. And we haven't talked about any of the malign behavior that may have been happening yeah. behind the, the scenes here on top of everything else. And then if you go the next time step, where we're really talking about decarbonizing our economy. Now you're talking about a massive amount of load that from electricity that's not serving current uses, but is, but is creating molecules, parts of, of the overall energy economy. And, and if, it's funny, nobody's talked about, well, how, how is, is a 90% green or 100% green grid gonna manage these types of events? And to my mind, that's where a lot of the management's gonna go on. You're gonna have, for example, on, on the utility side, load hybrid, load storage hybrid with, with wind and solar, that's dedicating a lot of its energy output to local production, local industrial activity, and never going on the grid. And the ability to curtail that when, when, when critical systems need it will be important. So as, as our 
energy infrastructure becomes more and more dependent on electricity in, in general, we really have to understand how to meter out the, the, the key functions when a crisis happens. Right. Okay, anybody else have a questions from, from within the, uh, the Q&A that people ask that you want to answer? Paul? So I, I, I just want to uh, you know, respond a little bit to what Eric and Allison have said. I guess I'm, I'm somewhat more skeptical of the idea that we can have you know, the vast majority of customers have solar and in-home storage that, that makes sense. I, th I, think, I think we will have some battery storage uh, it will play a role in, you know, in sort of short-term variability, uh, but um, you know, it's it still is, and and you know, and if we're talking about lithium-ion batteries, will remain relatively expensive for dealing with multi-day and seasonal reductions in power, and you know, and we will need uh, some other portion. I'm laughing at your cat, Jean. Sorry. Uh, well, she 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 wants food. She well, she's ahead. she's participating in our dialogue here. Uh, you know, she is uh, she's she's a great participant. So you know, so I think we will need at a grid level, you know, some level of weather independent generation that can that can play a role in that. It might be you know a next generation more efficient uh, gas unit with with uh, with carbon capture and storage. Maybe it'll be long-term storage technologies where we don't have to worry about energy density so much. It might be power to hydrogen or other fuels. Maybe it'll be advanced nuclear or fusion, or maybe it'll be you know, something like advanced or, or hot rock uh, geothermal. We don't know that. These are things that we really need to invest in over the next 10 years and see what the winner is gonna be. And I suspect there's gonna be some significant portion of that high renewable grid that is gonna need this component. And we have to figure out what it's going to be. Okay, well, Amber, go ahead. There's a question from Thomas Hand asked me to clarify what I mean by inefficient electric heating, and am I suggesting electricity should not be used for heating? No. Uh, however, uh, first of all, if you're going to do electric heating, use a good heat pump. Now, I'm not expecting people in Texas will buy a Minnesota heat pump that will work fine to minus 15 F at COP two or three without defaulting to resistance. But if you're going to do resistance heating, you should have a decently insulated building, a decently airtight building. And in a system emergency, it should be possible to limit your uh, daily, as Jim suggested, or your peak use so you don't crash the system. Anybody could have done the math I did after the fact to figure out 35 gigawatts of electric heating load. You know, we knew it already it was 29 in 2018, but evidently nobody thought through the consequences. Uh, and uh, by the way, if you are going to do a well insulated house, it, you, if you really do it right, like to passive standard, you won't need heat. I don't need heat here at down to minus 47 F up in the Rockies at 7,100 feet with up to 39 days of continuous midwinter cloud, 77 banana crops so far, it's cheaper to build that way. Uh, now, not everyone in Texas is going to build a house that doesn't need heating or cooling equipment, but <clears throat> actually the economics are awfully good. And when you're building as many houses as Texas does, that's well worth considering. Uh, but even a decently tightened insulated house will hold 50 to 60 degrees without any heat. And then you and your pipes won't freeze. Right. Okay, let's go to two minute summaries. Why don't we start, we, we, we go backwards. Why don't we start with who went last? Paul, you go first, we'll go backwards from how we started at the beginning. So I, I think that there are a couple of, of important points to take away from this. One is that there are real issues with the way we plan and the way we set up you know, resource adequacy metrics and electricity. And those are not just Texas issues. Those are issues that apply across all our power markets and everyone in each power market should be thinking not just about the deep freeze in Texas, but about severe weather and other high impact common mode events and figuring out you know, how we are going to plan for 
and integrate those into the system. Uh, and you know, secondly, I think you know I'll say a couple of things. You know, for Texas, but these are these are broadly applicable as well. Uh, one is. I think the, the, the kind of work we're doing in the RPE project that I mentioned, really trying to figure out both how you get flexible demand and how you, you know, spread out you know, the compensation for, for units that actually can be capable of dealing with severe weather so that that return is more stable is an important part of how we plan for these environments and, and, you know, and mitigate the impacts of these environments going, right, severe environments going for, forward. The other thing, and just, you know, trying to, trying to come back to, you know, to the dialogue with Bob B. I guess one of the things I would say is if, uh, you know, we can get a gas market right, you know, the work that my colleagues have done on gas system optimization suggests that those wildcatters would be able to sell more gas in tight market conditions, if we were optimizing those markets and, and making them both you know, efficient in and of themselves and well integrated with the electric sector. So there's an economic opportunity here, Bob, that perhaps you know, this is an opportunity to, to convince people they should, uh, they should figure out how to respond to. Thanks, Paul. Jim? Thanks. Uh... The Texas crisis was similar in origin to, to, to other crises that we have had, including the California power crisis, polar vortex of 2014. In extreme conditions, the power system does not operate normally. We already knew that. The Texas impacts are more complex due to the nature of their power market, the low level of energy efficiency in Texas homes, and frankly, lack of preparation. This event will spell financial doom for some. As Warren Buffett has put it, you find out who is swimming naked when the tide goes out. Well, the tide just went out. We're gonna see financial doom for some generators that could not deliver, but were hedged, for some retailers that could deliver, but were not hedged, and certainly doom for tens of thousands of Texas households who experienced pipe bursts and water damage. The natural gas cost spike was national. It was not localized in Texas. Gas prices were 10 and 20 times normal in California and in Boston. Those will affect every gas consumer in the US and every electric utility that relies on natural gas for electricity production. We'll say that next month or next year as fuel adjustment cost clauses and purchase gas adjustment clauses uh, are, are operated. People in Texas collectively ignored the longstanding advice of emergency preparedness agencies. Always be prepared to go 72 hours with no support from utilities or government. In my house, we do this with stored water, a wood stove, a propane camping stove, a camping water filter, flashlights and spare batteries, and an inver $100 inverter that connects to our car to supply our fridge, freezer, charge our computers and phones. Others do it with whole house generators running with on-site stored fuel in the form of propane, gasoline, or diesel. I ask everybody who stayed with us for the last two hours to take this Texas experience as a personal lesson and work on your own personal home emergency preparedness. Thanks, Jim. I want to get the information about that inverter for my car. Uh, Eric, you're next. Thank you. Well, uh, I want to pick up on something that Allison said. You know, there's been a tendency for Schadenfreude about what happened to those free market Texans. And I feel that is inhumane and unwise. These, these things will happen everywhere. And, and these lessons will have to be learned over and over everywhere. Uh, and the sooner people realize that, the better. Uh, and to me, that, that involves two elements. One is really looking across systems for, for understanding of risk and for understanding of solutions. 
And the second one, like I said, is, is being able to kind of deal with managed failure or, or that loop that Paul showed in, in one of his slides. Um, and, and if everybody just takes those two lessons back, then it'll, it'll be a two hours well, uh, well spent. And I, since Jim put up a slide, I, I put up I, some choice uh, words that I recently saw in a report um, from the Bank of International Settlements. These, these, are, not, um, these are not hippies. Uh, talking to you about <laughs> installing PV on their roof or whatever. But it's striking, it's, I've, I've highlighted this in red, basically what they're saying is, is that if we don't work across systems to address what's gonna happen with climate change and the impacts it, as it filters through our society, the climate related risk is gonna remain unhedgeable, which is very extreme language for a, um, for a central banker. and. Um, and reinforces the point I was trying to make. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Avery. Sorry, my cat is like getting away. Go ahead, Avery. He stepped away. Oh, he stepped away? Okay, Allison, you wanna go? Apparently he's visiting his bananas, thank you. <laughs> um, so I don't have any slides, I don't have any script, I don't have any net here, so here's, the, the couple of thoughts I want to leave you with are, first off, I applaud Jim for your household preparedness for bad outcomes. Remember that um, 15 to 20% of Texans live far below the poverty line and can't buy any of the stuff that you've got. So um, my view is we should be trying to protect customers and communities first. And that means massive amounts of, for in, to address challenges like the ones we just had and almost any challenge for that matter, we need to do energy efficiency first, critical facility protection, which means backup power systems and massive levels of sectionalization so that the next time we have to drop load, we can do it in a more humane and functional fashion that doesn't put, end up destroying our water systems and our houses as well as our electric system. Second, remember that I, I appreciate the point that one of my, my preceding speakers made about the increased challenges to our system as we go to more and more renewables and greater decarbonization and more electrification. This grid is only gonna get harder to operate over time. And the best thing that we can do to reduce the operating pressure on the grid is again, more energy efficiency and more distributed resources of every kind. I agree with all of you, but I wanna point out that I'm not just on team storage or team PV. I'm gonna start on energy efficiency first always. Energy efficiency first because it reduces the amount of the peak that you have to meet and it reduces the likelihood. Guy Clark has a song, Stuff That Works, Stuff That's Gonna Catch You When You Fall. You can't always assume that your inverter is gonna work or that somebody's remote commands and price signals and IT are gonna work when the next cold freeze happens or the next peak electric system is gonna happen. Stuff breaks and people attack stuff. So I want stuff like energy efficiency that's just gonna damn work all the time and protect me even if I'm not smart enough to realize all the good that it's providing. So yeah, let's all go to all your fancy other solutions that involve technology and comms and IT, but how about we do stuff that works first? Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Well, you guys have been great. Uh, we oh, have... Amory. Oh, go, oh, Amory, you're back. I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, and <laughs> sorry I had to talk. And, and Allison, let me build on that very important set of comments um, because as somebody remarked, uh, when the cow poop hits the fan, it does not spray equally in all directions. Uh, the worst homes are often housing the most vulnerable and historically marginalized Texans. Same everywhere. Now, caulk and insulation will work. They can't be cyber attacked. Uh, better standards can actually save energy and dollars every day of the year. The current Austin requirements cost effectively save almost a third of pre-code Texas homes total energy. Remember two thirds of Texas homes are pre-code unless they were in a city that went early. And 
when you do that, you need in Austin, 44% less energy for space heating, 63% less for air conditioning. Your comfort's the same or better. Importantly, in extreme weather, hot or cold, a tighter, more insulated house moderates your indoor temperatures and your loads on the electric and gas system. So you're keeping you safe, you're keeping other Texans safe. A couple of data points. Of two very similar Austin houses, old leaky stick built, single glazed, double hung, all that, houses built around 1914, one of them got insulated and caulked, and that retrofit made it hold at least 51 degrees outdoor in seven degree weather. The neighbor had to evacuate when they went to 36 degrees in eight hours in the, indoors and well below freezing next day. Started identical houses, they didn't end up that way. So second data point, if you really get good at this, you'll be like Paul and Alina Westbrook in Austin. Uh, they retrofitted to net zero with a 3.7 kilowatt PV system. Whenever the grid was up, they exported power to the grid. Their ground source heat pump and their insulation kept them at at least 61 through the episode, despite 25 and a half hours of outages and they were not set up to work with or without the grid, but I wish they had been. Interesting data. Better homes save lives, energy, and money. Now, in emergencies, 10 million informed Texas households can swiftly mobilize reserves of smart behavioral response that can do a lot. Uh, but to prudently guard lives and grid assets from extremes of future heat, cold, and everything else while saving money every day. We need building upgrades for all to be fully financed on utility bills delivered by private enterprise, along with, wherever possible, competing rooftop solar power that can safely keep the lights on, the stores open, the filling stations pumping with or without the grid. To conclude, most analyses still ask only what went wrong with supply? Good question, a lot to be learned on that, very important. But energy efficient buildings, the other half, the, the first half of the question, because with, without inefficient buildings electrically heated, we wouldn't be in this mess. Uh, the efficient buildings are the cheapest, deepest way to protect people, build resilience, strengthen our economy and security. Texans have paid a lot and suffered a lot to learn that. And I hope people everywhere will apply what they learned. Thank you. You all have been fantastic. I wanna thank you all for this. We had uh, 500 plus people watching. There's still 250 on, so it's pretty good. Uh, Mr. Where's, where's Vince? There you are. Uh, Victor, you wanna add anything, uh, Professor Glass? <laughs> All I'd like to say is this was a wonderful panel. Congratulations. We started out wondering whether two hours was too long. It seems like we could probably go on for another 20 minutes without any difficulty. In any case, I hope that this, uh, this discussion leads to some uh, changes in policy or at least discussions in, in the media. And I think uh, the suggestions here have, have really uh, been very enlightening. I mean, looking at better winterization, looking at uh, the demand side for more flexibility, better forecasts of, of a weather, better coordination among the utilities, better emergency response. All of these are topics that you've covered and I think you've offered a lot of suggestions that I thought were excellent. So again, thank you again. And for those who are here, we will send out the, uh, once we download who was here, we'll send out the slides and you'll be all set. Okay. And this will eventually be uploaded to YouTube. Thanks again, uh, you. Jean, you did a great job. <laughs> thank you all, you were great. I learned a lot. Stay active. <laughs> Take Goodbye. care everybody.